and to welcome you. So I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to the um, School of Medicine Team Science Town Hall. Um, as you're aware, we've actually we've scaled back the COVID uh, uh, talks, um, but these are uh, version uh, 2.0 of the 10:30 every Friday. They're now twice a month. Um, today we're going to talk about aging research and animal models. Um, and we have two speakers, uh, Rochelle Buffingstein, um, who is the Senior Principal Investigator for Calico Life Sciences, and then uh, William Murphy. Dr. Murphy is a Professor and Rice Chair of Research for the Department of Dermatology and in, uh, and in Internal Medicine in the School of Medicine. Um, I also want to personally uh, make sure that everyone knows about the McKnight Brain Research Foundation Innovator Awards in Cognitive Aging and Memory Loss. Um, that uh, is, I believe it's a 750,000 for um, someone who already has NIH funding. Um, and um, I, for full, full transparency, I'm a trustee of the McKnight Brain Research Foundation. And there is overwhelming enthusiasm on the part of the foundation to study cognitive aging and normal cognitive aging, normal memory loss, which I think we're gonna talk about here today. Angela, do you wanna present the slides? Um, about the most sure, recent, um, um, but before. actually, I I um, I made a little um, uh, tweaking, um, so I'm gonna share the screen. If if you could, Ana Lucia or Anu, allow me to to share uh, just just a very brief presentation to introduce our speakers and the subject um, today. So let me see. Okay, I can share now. And um, sorry, yes, so we selected aging um, research to showcase today because in the past century as our um, ages exponentially increased, the age of humankind, the lifespan of humankind, uh, we are focused on how to be also healthy, not just to live longer. And um, we believe that um, interdisciplinary research is very much helped with um, the utilization of animal models. And uh, here at UC Davis, um, uh, Dr. Murphy um, works on models of um, mice for aging. And Rochelle is this unique scientist who works on naked mole rats. And these are the animals that do not age. And I'm not gonna tell you more about um, uh, her research because um, uh, she's here to present that. But what I wanted to show here, and I don't know if you can see, I just- Angela, highlighted, yes? You're, you're not in, um, you're, we see this just, uh, not, you're not in presenter mode. Okay, sorry. So I don't think people can read it. They're great slides though. Uh, um, okay, now I lost. Can you see me? Can you see my slides in no. present? Um, okay, I think you have to share your screen in or you share whichever desktop you're using. Yes, is this any better now? No, no, okay. you need to reshare or uh, Anu, do you want to pull them up for? Yeah, they're not up at all now. Stop. There you go. Okay, perfect. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Ah, great. Yes. So, Anu, can you skip to the next slides to make it a bit shorter? Because I think the bottom line is really on the bottom line on the right lower corner. In the past five years, UC Davis has amassed over $100 million on aging research. And I think we should capitalize on that and take courage and continue collaboration and apply for grants, especially the one that Alison just brought up. Can you uh, bring up the next slide for me, Anu, please? And we have some uh, stellar researchers on aging um, who are our um, uh, top uh, grantees, including Rachel Whitmer, Dr. Charles Ticali, uh, Gino Cordobasi, John Olichny, and, and um, Kumar Rajan. And they actually contributed to the greatest proportion of the grants that, um, that I mentioned before. And if we can go to the last slide, please. 
Yes, so this is just a list of upcoming grants that we would like to encourage all the uh, attendees here to, um, to tackle. The letter of intent for the McKnight Foundation is due um, July 15 and full grant proposal will be uh, due um, in August. And there are additional um, awards, emergency award uh, due November 19 and um, uh, National Institute of Aging um, award on advancing diversity in aging research through undergraduate education. You, um, it actually, it's open, it's rolling, it's um, open until uh, 2023. Uh, also research infrastructure development, if necessary, and aging research dissertation for trainees, um, if necessary, these are rolling awards open on, until uh, 2023. So with this, I would like to close and um, would like um, our speakers to, to start their um, presentations. And um, I'm hoping that there will be a lively discussion afterwards and we would inspire some collaborations to spark. Thank you. Rochelle, Rochelle, you can... can you share your screen? I'm going to try, let's see. It was working pretty well a few minutes ago, so let's hope we can do the same now. Oh, that's a scary picture. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, well, thank you for this lovely opportunity to share some of our work and to introduce you to this very attractive looking model as you see over here. And I'm, what I'm hoping to do is to give you a naked mole rat perspective on aging and the many opportunities that it may present. So my brief talk outline is as follows. I'm gonna introduce the model to you. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the age-related changes we see in body composition, cardiovascular function and brain function maybe. Um, I'm going to spend a fair bit of my time talking about the immune system and stress and cancer resistance. And the main focus that I currently have at Calico is I'm looking at its role as a model for brain stroke, for cancer resistance, and for cardiovascular injury. As you know, most biomedical research focuses solely on four models, uh, yeast, worms, flies, and mice. And this is despite the fact that there are more than 8 million species out there. These species have been primarily chosen because on the premise that below the skin, we're all the same in terms of cell structure and function. And while all four are evolutionary distant, all of these standard models share an important feature, at least for the study of aging, in that as each of these organisms get older, its health declines and its probability of dying increases. And the short lifespans of these animals permit very rapid examination of the mechanisms that lead to those functional declines and the potential compensatory interventions to extend their lifespan. For example, we know that C. elegans, just by manipulating a single gene can extend lifespan quite dramatically and we know from studies in all these organisms that caloric restriction seems to work in also extending their lifespan. So in case of mice, if you restrict energy intake by 60% of that oblivion, there's quite a significant increase in lifespan. But what we don't know about these animals is if these animals share mechanisms that us long-lived humans employ to extend lifespan or if humans and other long-lived species employ additional defense mechanisms against aging that might be absent in these short-lived models. So an alternative approach is to study animals that are extremophilic, that have evolved to resist very harsh environmental conditions that are also commonly seen in diseased states and learn by example how nature has already solved the kinds of problems. For example, with regard to successfully aging species, we know that humans have a maximum lifespan of about 122 and a half years. 
And in every single clade that animals or that scientists have looked at, there are animals that have attained exceptional longevity. So mole rats are a rodent that lives about 38 years, bats do the same, clams apparently live up to 500 years, and that's determined by counting the rings on the shells, and even green sharks have attained longevity of about 500 years. And some of these models are clearly much more feasible to use in the laboratory than others, so it would be pretty hard to look at whales, uh, sharks, and animals like that. Oops, why have I jumped a slide there? Another important aspect for aging research is to find species that resist the burden of lifestyle diseases. So we know that horses, whales, elephants, and mole rats are very resistant to cancer, especially relative to their body size. We've learned a lot about uh, obesity-related research from hibernating bears. Hibernating bears, as I'm sure many of you know, can put up put on more than 200 kilos in three months while they're feeding and fattening up for the long winter fast. And yet they don't seem to show obesity related issues. If anything, they become insulin sensitive during their hyperphagic phase and insulin resistant during uh, fasting. We've also learned quite a lot from bears about bone loss. These animals are immobile for months on end and yet, unlike humans, don't show the bone loss that we do if we have our legs in a cast. And they also don't urinate for most of those months of hibernation, and yet don't suffer from the kidney-associated diseases with anuria. Um, mole rats also are quite interesting in this regard in that they also seem to be little butterballs. They're about 40% body fat, and they, you'll see, uh, are very good at maintaining bone structure and stability. Another group of animals that we can learn a lot from with regard to human diseases are diving mammals and birds that seem to be able to resist the problems of hypoxia and then reperfusion or reoxygenation uh, that comes with it and the accompanying tissue damage. And here again, more rats fit into this category in that they're very hypoxic tolerant and very hypercapnic tolerant. And I've taken out those slides but I'm happy to talk a little bit about it if you have questions. So what exactly is a mole rat and why is it a model of successful aging? Mole rat is a mouse-sized rodent. It's found only in the Horn of Africa. This is the terrain in which I collected my animals many, many years ago. The only signs of them there are these tiny little volcanoes of soil that they kick out when they're excavating a complex maze of underground burrows. There's a picture of me collecting and finding burrows in the wild. And their burrow system may extend several kilometers in length and two meters in depth. They're very clean animals. They have toilets or latrines scattered throughout the colony. One year their nest area, others scattered throughout. They never go really onto the surface. They kick out the soil as you see over here to create those volcanoes. And they feed on underground roots and tubers. Their nearest relatives that you will know of are the guinea pig, which they diverged from about 39 million years ago. And they're closely related to about 53 species of mole rat that are found in sub-Saharan Africa. Here's one, the Damaraland mole rat. They first became famous for the fact that they are eusocial, meaning that they live like bees uh, and ants with only a single female conducting all the reproduction in the colony. Um, she's a bully. She uh, maintains her reproductive suppression of subordinates, primarily by bullying animals, by pulling their tails, by biting and fighting. Um, and there's a lot of work that's now being done on their use sociality. From my perspective, this is a picture of my oldest animal. He's now 39 years of age. It's a male. Um, you can see over here, he doesn't look particularly old, although he's got quite a lot of fat and a pretty jowl neck feature going on there. This longevity is quite remarkable when one compares it with other species. So as you probably know, everything in biology seems to scale with body size and longevity is no exception. And the for a doubling of body mass, you get a 16% change 
in lifespan per species, not within a species, but across species. Animals that live as long as predicted would have a longevity quotient of one, and animals that are long lived have longevity quotients greater than one, meaning their actual lifespan is greater than that predicted. And you'll see here that porcupines and other mole rats and guinea pigs live about as long as predicted on the basis of body size. Mice are extremely short lived, living only half as long as predicted on the basis of body size. And humans, mole rats and bats all live about four times longer than predicted on the basis of size alone. Naked mole rats are of exceptional biogerontological interest for another reason besides their extreme longevity, and that is that the risk of dying doesn't seem to increase with age. So Gompertz was an actuarial scientist in the 1800s, and he developed all the tables that insurance companies use to work out how much insurance you should pay based on how old you are. And we know for humans, this blue line over here, that when you get to about three or four times the age of sexual maturity, your risk of dying increases exponentially. Uh, so for every eight years, you're doubling your risk, but once you get to 35, 40, you're on this very slippery slope. And the same thing is true of horses, sheep, cows, dogs, you name it. They all have a pretty steep Gompertsian mortality between three and six times the age of sexual maturity. For mice, this number is a little bit longer, come 10 times the age of sexual maturity, they're on that slippery slope. And for naked mole rats, we've gone to 27 times the age of sexual maturity, and we have not yet reached this increased risk of dying. Not saying they never will get there, but they certainly haven't got there at an age that's pretty remarkable. Indeed, if you look at the risk of dying as a function of 10,000 people, 10,000 mole rats per day, Animals have the highest risk of dying in their first six months of life, and then their risk of dying declines quite dramatically with increasing age. So unlike other mammals, the risk of dying does not increase with age after sexual maturity, and like young animals, death is stochastic. When one thinks of the breeding females, one would imagine that breeding females having that huge metabolic cost associated with reproduction should have shorter lifespans, but we see indeed quite the opposite. So while the median lifespan for subordinates is 19 years, so an animal should live about 40 years as a maximum lifespan, we've noticed for the breeding females, although we've been monitoring them for more than 30 years, that we have not reached the 50% mortality rate. So we don't know when or how long they really will live. They show no menopause, they continue to breed throughout their long lives, and they seem to live longer than the subordinates. So they're defying a key theory of aging, the disposable soma theory of aging. So one thing is living longer, another thing is living in good health. And the real question that we're interested in for humans and for mole rats is, we don't wanna live long in a stage of decrepitude, we want to live healthy and vigorating lifestyles rather than what you see in this image over here. So we've been looking at the aging phenotype in naked mole rats, and I've chosen just a couple of things to point out to you. We've looked at blood pressure and we see that at least until the age of 25 years of age, there's no change in blood pressure or vascular stiffness, which is the pulse wave velocity. But more important than that, if we look at heart function, we've done some EKGs and we see no increased risk of irregular heart rhythms. We don't see signs of atrial fibrillation. We know in humans that come the age of 50 to 60, you're starting to see an increased risk of irregular heartbeats. And the same is true for mice. By the time you're one and a half years of age, you've got a huge number of irregular heartbeats taking place. When we do the same kind of measurements in mole rats, and here we've gone to 34 years of age, we see no increased risk in irregular heart intervals. In fact, we found very few cases where there was an irregular heartbeat as seen in this image over here compared to the mice, which has many strange patterns occurring. Um, looking at, at cardiac function, 
we've used ultrasound to measure all variables of cardiac function. And here I've only chosen one slide to epitomize the change that you're seeing. And here we're looking at cardiac reserves. So this is really pushing the animals to their limit using an exercise mimetic dobutamine. And we're measuring stroke volume, ejection fraction, heart rate, and calculating cardiac output. And you can see all the way to 35 years of age, regardless of whether you're a female in red or a male shown in blue, there's no in, uh, change or no decline in cardiac reserve. And that's a pretty large sample size that we've looked at. Contrast that with our study in mice. We see that in young mice, they have a high cardiac reserve. And by the time they're 18 months of age, they're on a pretty slippery slope of going downhill, unable to pump their hearts the same way or to the same youthful level that the mole rat is able to do. We've done the same thing looking at body composition. We see no change in lean mass or fat mass. And this is a slide of bone mineral density through the femur. And again, there's no change. The R squared is 0.01. Whereas in mice, you're seeing this decline in both males and females in bone mineral density. Intriguingly, when you actually look at the bone, and this is an image through trabecular bone of the femur, you can see a nice clearly defined growth plate in black in the mice, in a young mouse, and in an old mouse, a two-year-old mouse. The purple is the bone, and you can see the bone is almost disappearing in the old mouse. Whereas in the old naked or two-year-old mole rat, which is the same age as that, you can see a lot thicker bone, the growth plate still intact like it is in the two-year-old mouse. But look at a 24-year-old mole rat, the bone is completely resorbed as is extensive bone remodeling in much the same way they is in humans. We've looked at many other variables as well. Here's an example of the thymus. In the case of the mouse, the thymus declines very early in life and then stabilizes as it involutes. Morats are born with much smaller thymuses. They enlarge for the first couple of months of life, which is a big difference with the mouse. And then they maintain constant size throughout their lives, but it's much smaller than what you see in the mouse. We do see a few signs of involution with fat infiltration, but nothing like what you see in the mouse. We also looked at the immune system of the mole rat and found other striking differences with mice. Here's some H&E signs, uh, slides, and you can see the spleen from a mouse and a naked mole rat. The purple is the white pulp where the T and B cells are, and you can see mice have much larger areas of these white pulp compared to the mole rats. Um, most of the uh, spleen of a mole rat is red pulp, and most of the cells in the mole rat are myeloid in nature rather than lymphocytes as seen in the B and T cells. So in mice using single cell RNA-seq, we found that the lymphoid to myeloid ratio is 90% lymphoid to 10% myeloid. In the mole rat, just like in humans, the lymphoid's contribution is much smaller, it's about 40%, and the myeloid contribution is much larger. Intriguingly, naked mole rats lack a key cell type that's seen in mice. Mice have a large population of NK cells, which is completely absent in the naked mole rat. We could not find any signs of natural killer cells. And this is paradoxical to its well-documented feature of cancer resistance. And we're quite intrigued by what's going on there. We looked into this in quite a lot of detail and found that the cells that have some of the natural killer cell properties like granzyme IA are found in a population of T cells, which we think are cytotoxic T cells, but they lack a key marker of NK cells, the NCR1 expression. Naked Moritz also very resistant to stresses and we've done this using whole animals, organs, tissue slices, fibroblasts, organelles, and even proteins. Um, more rats can survive hypoxia for fairly long periods of time. We have not been able to induce stroke in our naked mole rats, even at 4% oxygen for more than an hour and a half. Um, and they seem to survive most toxic insults, but generally cells stop proliferating and they take it slow. Um, 
don't really want to spend too much time on here, but here's another slide where we're looking at fibroblasts using a whole range of toxins. And you can see that the LD50, the dose that kills 50% of the cells, always is higher in naked mole rats than in mice, with the LD50 fold difference between mice and mole rats ranging between two to a hundred fold. And as I mentioned earlier, while mice cells still proliferate, even when most of them are dead, mole rats stop proliferating when most of them are alive. One toxin we thought they would be uh, more sensitive to was UV, having evolved to live in the dark for millions of years. And we found that this too was not the case. While uh, nude mice that are immune competent were subjected to sunburn, they showed all sorts of signs of skin damage, edema, uh, immune cell infiltration, fibrosis, and hypoplasia, we saw no signs of real tissue damage in the naked mole rat, and we did some tissue injury scores to show that. We continued with this treatment. This was just a one-off treatment at different time points post-injury, but we continued treating them twice weekly with this high dose of UV for six months. And while the mast cells showed even greater signs of hypoplasia and immune cell infiltrate, we saw no change in the mole rats. While the mast cells developed little papillomas and ulcers and, and lesions, there was no tumor incidence at all seen in the naked mole rat, whereas all the mice we had by week 15 had tumors of some sort. We did proteomics on this and we found that Mole rats are very much more responsive. Within two hours of exposure, we see differential expression of proteins in the mole rat, but not in the mouse. Whereas after six months of exposure, the mouse shows many more changes in proteins compared to the mole rat. Intriguingly, the mouse shows big changes in immune system function and a decline in fatty acid metabolism, whereas the mole rat seems to be upregulating all the tumor suppressor proteins and seems to be decreasing amino acid metabolism and protein synthesis. And that was epitomized in this change in signaling pathway seen over here in the six shared pathways between the mouse and the naked mole rat. In the case of mice, the AKT signaling pathway goes up as more proteins are being made. And in the case of the mole rat, this, this pathway seems to go down. And this is all driven, as you know, or some of you know, by P10, an important tumor suppressor protein. And we see that mole rats have this increase in P10 and maybe, and have many copies of this gene as well. And maybe this participates or contributes to their incredible stress resistance. Finally, we uh, took some cells from naked mole rats and mice, and we transformed them using SV40T antigen and HRAS, and we implanted these uh, transformed fibroblasts into immune compromised mice and back into the naked mole rat from which the cells came. When these were implanted in mice, all of them formed tumors. Some of them grew more slowly than others, but in the end, all did. When we implanted them back into the naked mole rats, by day 14, they'd formed fairly large tumors that were palpable, hard, and measurable, but by day 39, those tumors had spontaneously shrunk and disappeared completely. And we're very interested in trying to find out if this is due to some unusual cytotoxic T cell or whether it is some other cause for this loss of tumorigenesis in the naked mole rat. And then my last slide just looks at some of the molecular mechanisms that we've been trying to get a handle on to get an idea as to what are the mechanisms naked mole rats use that might enable them to live so long and reduce the stress of lifestyle diseases. We've got lots of indications that there's a well-controlled genomic stability, proteomic stability, and oxidative stress response. I've hinted briefly at their cell cycle mechanisms that they switch off very quickly. Uh, when situations are very stressful. And so to summarize my very rapid little talk here, I hope you'll see that naked mole rats maintain a youthful phenotype throughout their life. They have a very low incidence of cancer and other diseases. 
They maintain youthful-like response to stresses. Surprisingly, they lack natural killer cells, but that doesn't seem to be a problem. And they seem to give us an indication that long-lived species likely employ different or additional mechanisms to those of short-lived species. And if we can identify what these mechanisms are, they will have very far-reaching application. With that, I'd just like to acknowledge my collaborators and sources of funding and take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Rochelle. Wow, we are, we are completely uh, <laughs> speechless. Uh, th this, this is fascinating, but I, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, one from Andrew uh, asking, so what do these animals die of? And then the other question is from actually Bill um, saying that because these animals are more closely related to guinea pigs, have you had a chance to study guinea pigs in comparison with um, naked more rats? And the third question is, um, uh, yeah, actually it's just for me saying that we should uh, probably uh, not have too much time on questions because we're gonna run out of time. So. Can you quickly answer the, why do they die? And have you done guinea pigs? Yes, so I can answer the guinea pig question first. We've done a fair bit of comparison with guinea pigs and Demoraland mole rats. The thing that worries me about them is that they're much larger and we know that everything correlates with body size, but they do share a very similar, immu uh, not immune system, I haven't looked at that. I know guinea pigs have uh, furlough cells, which are their equivalent of natural killer cells that naked mole rats don't have. And they show a very similar insulin and glucose tolerance to what we see in the naked mole rats. So usually, although I've only shown mice and naked mole rats here, if I find something interesting, I go back and do it in 10 different species of rodents to try and see if this is a conserved general mechanism. Does it correlate with species lifespan? And I try and keep it within animals of similar sized mass. What animals die of is a million dollar question that I still can't give you an answer to, despite the fact that we've done many necropsies because we keep them in a fairly hot room, they rot very quickly. Uh, the veterinary pathologists, Denise and I at your institution being one of them, tells me they have periodontal disease. And I think that's always the last sign when an animal stops eating the bacteria in their mouth go a little crazy and you start seeing signs of periodontal disease. I don't think that's what kills them, but they always show that when they're in their final stages of their life. We usually just find them dead. We've had one case where we think they've had a heart attack. We've had five cases of cancer and we've seen quite a few signs of kidney disease, but we don't know what exactly killed them. Thanks so much. So um, um, we have another question from Paul. Uh, regarding NK cells, but let's discuss that after uh, Bill's presentation. So, uh, Bill, could you put up your uh, presentation, please? Can you see my presentation? One size does not yeah. matter. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Good. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to talk about some of our studies. I've been doing uh, cancer immunotherapy, immunology modeling for over 35 years, uh, looking at preclinical aspects. Uh, I was at NCI for 12 years, and there was the, always the joke that uh, the director said at that time that man, man is a poor model for mouse cancer. So we always try to make our preclinical models probably more reflective of the human scenario but I'm gonna talk about our latest stuff looking at viral infections. And I'm trying to see how I can, uh, there we go. So uh, the pandemic has really highlighted uh, the need for this, uh, particularly uh, you know, what happened last year. And really because of the almost desperate attempt to find therapeutics, uh, we were, people were drawing on different models the whole term cytokine storm actually arose from bone marrow transplantation and graft versus host disease. And some of the same therapeutics in these kinds of uh, conditions have been used for uh, SARS-CoV-2. So I'm gonna talk about literally how we sort, sort of had to figure out how to draw upon what we know in our preclinical models. Clearly aging was a major issue with COVID-19 mortality and morbidity. 
when you look at the mortality rates in the population, you're dealing with very striking demographics where the uh, aging population was susceptible. And so this is something that we wanted to therefore model in preclinical models that we had. Um, so we want to look at the impact of aging. So we've seen that with cancer immunotherapy, but what about, what is the impact of aging on the immune system? As an immunologist, uh, the immune system to me rec represents the epitome of personalized medicine because within the same individual over time, it is constantly being challenged and changing and aging itself without any challenges changes the immune system uh, as you sort of, as you could tell from the previous talk, which was outstanding. But normally uh, the immune system development, particularly with T cells changes uh, due to thymic involution. Um, this constant changing is also exacerbated because uh, human beings are constantly being exposed to new pathogens and challenges. Therefore, you're always seeing the immune system adapting to that. However, there's also these aspects within the human population like obesity or the presence of comorbidities as we age that definitely impacts immune function that needs to be taken into consideration. I'd like to point out also so from a philosophy standpoint, there's, this is a new paradigm in human evolution. You know, you know, before the advent of antibiotics and vaccines, uh, the human uh, species never had really this kind of opportunity to have this prevalence of ad advanced age uh, population expanding. I'm talking greater than 60, 70 years old, but also uh, the population density is increasing and then also travel accessibility. That means we're constantly giving new pathogens back and forth which in our species as we evolved really didn't have that same kind of uh, emphasis. And therefore the immune system had evolved in the sense of once you reach a certain age, what you were exposed to was pretty much going to be good enough to keep you around for the life of uh, you know, your being. And that's totally different now. And so, and that's you know, because of the thymus is really highlighted by that. Um, you hear this word a lot, inflammaging. And the alterations of the immune system with aging affects every arm of the immune system. Um, it affects the innate response where you see dynamic changes within the different populations of innate cells, myeloid and K cells. But noticeably it's the adaptive response that really changes as well because as our T cells change, our ability to mount new responses to new pathogens change. And then the inflammation is also correlated with what we call a meta-inflammatory response associated with aging. And that means we have a hyper-inflammatory response, partly due to myeloid dysregulation, but also keeping in mind as we age, there's an increase in uh, adipose tissue, decrease in muscle mass. So it's a culmination of these kinds of conditions that totally change the immune landscape. With T cells, as uh, actually highlighted by the previous talk, which I found fascinating, this is very profound because when we're young, basically we have a large thymus, we have a huge output of naive or what I call T cells that are capable of responding to new pathogens because they get sensitized and they expand. Because of that, the dynamics are very different. You don't have these long lived memory cells in the various tissues, as you'll see later in life. And you see very robust, immune responses to new pathogens. However, with time and antigen challenge in an elder person, because the thymic involution starts early after adolescence, the thymic involution causes minimal new T cell output. So what you have is pretty much what you are going to have for the rest of your life, for the most part. The thymus was never geared to produce constant new supply of T cells. And this changes therefore the naive memory ratio and you see these now T cells residing in various tissues where they're called upon to act. Um, but this also means there's impaired primary responses. That means new antigen responses. And this has been well documented with influenza vaccines and other vaccines. And this is part of the problem. Part of the other problem is the mouse model that we use. This is from Jackson Laboratories. The vast majority of preclinical studies use two to three month old mice. Why? Because they're cheaper, they're $26 an animal, but that's basically equivalent to an upper adolescent. 
What we really need to be looking at is the elderly model because that is our demographic. And that means you have to use mice that are older. And actually as mice become more cleaner, they're living longer and longer. And we need to actually move that bar. The problem is a 24 month old mouse is about $500. And so you can see it's really a, a major impact in trying to do preclinical studies. We actually looked at young versus old mice, looking at this uh, T cell repertoire, and we find that yes, young mice, most of the T cells are naive. That means they're ready to go. However, when we look at an old animal, it's completely inverted. That means you have less of a naive pool to draw from and you get more memory cells that have to do the business end. And these may be two antigens that are irrelevant to uh, like tetanus and other things that may not help us to a new viral pathogen. So we wanted to use a primary mouse infection model to study age-related immune responses. Why? Because when the virus caused everything to shut down last year, I had 22 to 24 month old mice that I was gonna use in cancer studies. And instead we went with viral infection because we figured the similar paradigms could exist that maybe we could draw some inferences from. So the model we use is cytomegalovirus or CMV. It's a fantastic virus because it's got broad tropism. It's very high clinically relevant. It's, uh, it's very prevalent. Almost every species that gets infected by it, it's got strong adaptive and innate uh, responses. And more importantly, an acute uh, CMV infection can uh, cause massive lung pneumonitis and lead to death as well as liver effects. So it provided a nice model. We use a mouse model. It's MCMV, it's resistant, is very similar, similar pathogenesis to the human scenario. And you can see in the right, you get initial toll receptor engagement, inflammatory cytokines, you get innate pathways, then ad adaptive pathways. So it represents a very nice model. And the tools are there that we could use where we keep everything the same, except one mouse is very old, one mouse is very young, but they're genetically identical. And more importantly, we can track the virus specific T cells with tetramers. So our hypothesis was similar to people, advanced age mice will be more susceptible to MCMV infection, uh, possibly due to immunosuppression and reduction of the naive T cells. And then mirror, uh, this will mirror what we're seeing in other viral infections. So all we did was we take a young mouse and a very old mouse and we infected them with the same dose of virus. And then we looked for survival, pathology, immune phenotype. And we looked at various other parameters, including viral resistance, which we can measure by titers. And what we found is using a dose of virus where all the young mice look fine and they clear the virus, the old mice showed rapid mortality affecting greater than half of them. So we're seeing right away a big difference. And this difference was very important because what we saw similar to other viral infections was looking at the lung. These mice were dying, they had rapid breathing, they were dying uh, from lung pathology. You can see the difference right there using the same dose of virus. And when we looked for it by immunofluorescence for apoptosis, that's the bright yellow, we saw increased apoptotic uh, events in the lungs of the aged mice. So we're definitely seeing a very big differential due, due to aging. So what was going on? Well, similar to SARS-CoV-2 and actually even cancer immunotherapies, we saw cytokine storm. When we looked at interferon, TNF, and IL-6, the aged mice, while they were dying, we saw massive cytokine production, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and this correlated with the uh, reduced survival. Importantly, we also then looked for virus-specific T cells in the young versus old, and again, we consistent with what, what we expected. We saw that the old mice had markedly reduced numbers of adaptive antigen-specific T cells, and this correlated with reduced survival. However, this was very surprising to us because despite the increased mortality, pathology, and reduced virus to specific T cells, we saw actually the viral titers in the uh, old versus young were comparable. So what that was telling us is that it wasn't the virus that was actually causing the increased mortality and pathology and death. The viral infection was comparable, except the old mice were dying. And so what this was telling us is that we actually have a model where we can distinguish between immune mediated pathology versus viral pathology. And that immune mediated pathology following viral infection is exacerbated by advanced age. 
And this is mirroring what we are seeing in both acute SARS-CoV-2 as well as other conditions in which in the aged population, there is a cytokine dysregulation, cytokine storm, and it's actually being seen also in younger people, uh, particularly with obesity, that can also cause significant pathology. It's in the mouse model where we can control for everything that we can say it's not due to increased viral load because the viral load was different. This is actually immune pathology. The body doesn't know what it's going to be able to use to respond against the pathogen. It just uses what it has. And unfortunately, as we age, the dysregulation can cause more deleterious consequences than even the infection. So this actually then correlates very nicely with the cytokine storm and reduced adaptive T cell processes. However, what's fascinating is the comparable viral resistance suggests either this increased innate or cytokine storm is allowing for compensation or even that little reduced amount of T cells that we're getting is sufficient for controlling the viral uh, infection in these mice. So if we wanna take a take home message, if we start looking at viral induced pathology, there's two arms. There's the immune mediated pathology, the immune system run amok, and then the virus mediated pathology. With obesity and aging, I don't have the time to go into it, but we see the same parallels, even you're looking at young obese mice. We see cytokine storm, and what dominates the response is increased immune mediated pathology and, and, and death. However, you do need the immune system because if you don't have the immune system and we have studies looking at immune deficient mice, you actually see then the virus wins and because of in increased viral replication, dissemination and pathology. So there is a balance between needing the immune system but also controlling the immune system. And this may give us some ideas on how we can potentially use this to our advantage in aging or obesity. If we can control the innate response, we may be able to obviate or suppress the immune mediated cytokine storm pathology. Also, the converse, if we can increase the adaptive T cell responses, we may be able to also bypass that need for that innate immune system. And this may allow for better viral control without the pathological consequences. So what are the next steps, the therapeutic implications? We wanna understand the innate adaptive dynamics and dysregulation because we're very interested in this NK T cell macrophage triumvirate that seems to be changing with aging and therefore also may be playing different roles with aging and obesity. And we wanna start looking at other organs because as we know, both with influenza and then now with SARS-CoV-2 with long COVID, looking at neurologic effects may be actually also of critical importance. There's evidence that with SARS-CoV-2 long-term effects, these may be partially autoimmune mediated. So we need to understand how these are penetrating, including in the brain. And then we wanna look at the effects of intervention. So we actually have data that people have been looking at IL-6 blockade and TNF blockade. We actually have exciting data looking at combined blockade. We see increased protection from cytokine storm. And this may give us another handle on how to better control uh, the immunopathology we see. And then we want to then link using both the mouse and then large animals and non-human primates, working with the primate center with uh, Dr. Ireley, with Dr. Tarantel. We want to look at the effects of influenza, SARS-CoV-2 with aging, and to see if we can see similar paradigms as far as the inflammatory components being exacerbated and if interventions can help. But this highlights the need that we need to be using all models. And this is what I found was the problem. And this is, I've actually communicated this with Dr. Collins at NIH in, in the past. Where are the translational studies being supported? Because despite this worldwide significance and severity of the pandemic, if you actually go on the NIH data websites, there's a paucity. It's actually, there's almost very little NIH initiatives that are actually used to look at viral infections, whether it's SARS-CoV-2 or even other viruses like this, as well as the vaccines, using these aged, obese, autoimmune models. And these can give us critical insights outside of relying on clinical parameters, because as we know, basically this week, it's just been reported that cardiac events in young people, young men have been noted. So these, these initiatives 
right now, if you look at them, are primarily clinical. And we need to actually invest now, like a Manhattan Project, on looking at preclinical models so it can guide us. Because the next stage is happening where we're going to have to do boosting, and we need to understand how these infections have long-term effects. So the advantage of the preclinical models, they're not a great, they're not perfect, but they allow you to control for one variable at a time, and they allow for mechanistic assessments because you can look at every organ. And so there's an urgent need to actually use these models because a lot of the therapeutics were actually drawn from other diseases and now are being applied. We still don't know how chloroquine really works. We don't know a lot of these therapies and it really, there should be initiatives on that. So I'd like to thank the people in my lab, numerous collaborators, which I don't have time to go into, but these are the people doing these projects right now. They work during the COVID epidemic as far as keeping, using the old mice and allowing these insights and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Wow, this was also excellent and so well related to Rochelle's uh, uh, talk. And I think both talks sort of uh, threw up the idea of the innate immune system and its significance in regulating a lot of the um, uh, disease processes including um, uh, overinflammation or exaggerated inflammation, inflammaging and auto-inflammatory -infl and systemic inflammatory diseases. And actually there was a question that um, I passed over from, um, from Paul Lucy regarding uh, NK cells that, um, that Rochelle address, but I, I would like to discuss it a little bit. Paul, would you like to uh, um, ask out your question? Um, no, go ahead, Ash. Thank you for picking up on that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think the question was that, um, did more red progenitors not evolve NK cells or NK cells are lost during evolution into the modern mole rat. And actually, um, I think Rochelle's response was that it looks like it's an evolutionary uh, loss and there are just um, guesses what other cell type would take over the, um, the NK cell uh, function in antiviral and, um, and anti-cancer um, immunity. And, um, Rochelle uh, thought that because of the lifestyle of the animals, this um, mutation in um, uh, inactivating NK cells um, did not affect their health. So apparently there is, um, there is hope that um, the immune system is versatile enough to compensate for one or two of the, of the disabilities. But I, I think much more research will need to be done in regards um, to the aging of these, um, these uh, cell types. Um, Steve um, McSorley asked if um, the lower CMV specific T cell response also observed in the lung tissue. That, that uh, question is um, for um, um, Bill. Is the low expansion due to the fact that these mice have fewer naive precursors or just inherent low proliferative capacity of aging? Well, that's a really good question. I think it's more a standpoint of having less naive repertoire. Um, and because from a proliferative standpoint, they seem to be fine. And we've actually been looking at anti-PD-1 to see if we could augment uh, an effect. So I, I think it's two things. One is there's less of them that are capable of responding to a high side. We've published on this and others, just like with LPS induced paralysis, you actually see a paralysis of the immune system under high inflammatory uh, components because of uh, SOX uh, induction. And we've published on that as well. And so part of the problem is the immune system is always paranoid about autoreactivity. And so whenever you have this dysregulated inflammatory toll engagement uh, response, some of the T cells will actually shut down. So I actually think it's a combination of less and then they're being suppressed. Uh, and that's actually going to cause either further impairment down the wrong line. 
And um, uh, Sacha had a, um, a really um, excellent point um, saying that um, there is a parallel um, in processes during viral infection and, um, and aging. And in fact, in aging people, viral infection um, has an additive um, effect. I, I don't know if, if you want to um, elaborate a little more on this, Sacha. Uh, Bill, that, that was a terrific presentation and absolutely, you know, hits home with current crisis. Uh, so the issue is the viral infections themselves actually drive senescence or senescence type of phenotype. Mm -hmm. And so is this uh, just the additive effect of it that, you know, the, that stage is already set in uh, during the aging, and so it just exacerbates the effect. So uh, how well, do you counteract <laughs> it's just an editive effect like this? Well, I think that, you know, that's a good point. There are actually two components. We have our memory T cells that are capable of responding, and some of them actually can be like NK cells because they can be nonspecific. And then they're reduced adaptive. It's only with the advent of bone marrow transplant studies and even aid studies that people even thought the thymus could produce anything new. And they can, because never, we never had to before, but it's not geared for that. And so it's going to be a matter of figuring a way to make the most of the little that we have that are capable of responding. The virus infection we're doing is an acute primary versus as you know, with classic CMV, it's more of a latent uh, component mm -hmm. that comes up later on. So it, it, you raise a good point. I think that an inherent problem with mouse models is we keep them too clean and they're specific pathogen free. So this is the only pathogen they've seen. And so I think it's even gonna be more striking when you look at say more dirty mice, where actually a mouse usually only lives six months to a year, our mice in our lab can live two to three years. And so I think we have to be careful with those caveats when we're doing an immune system kind of uh, correlation. And I think this is where the primate model could be very valuable, but it's just a matter of, I think the big issue is NIH has to really go for broke and start funding these initiatives rather than just waiting for, oh, we should have been looking at this. Uh, there's nothing proactive going on right now considering the, the cost of not doing it. So, but those are really good questions. Thank you. Yes, and uh, Rivka uh, just remarked that both uh, presentations uh, were fascinating. So, so thank you so much. And I, I, I do see um, uh, Kim Carter here, and, and I think we cannot um, close an aging session without mentioning that uh, for a very, very long time, the first time just a couple of days ago, um, FDA approved a new um, Alzheimer's um, disease drug, Aduhelm. I'm not really um, sure what exactly the, um, the mechanism of action of, of that drug is, but, but Ken, if I may ask, do you think these animal models and our um, stipulation on inflammation and, um, and aging would have a relevance to cognitive aging? Or if Kim has logged out, then anybody else would like to comment on this. Rochelle, have you done um, uh, cognitive studies on these animals? We haven't done cognitive studies per se, but we have looked at beta amyloid and tau in the naked morat brain as a function of age. And intriguingly, the, the morat never seems to read the textbook and always makes me scratch my head. Even young naked mole rats have higher levels of beta amyloid and tau in their brain than old triple transgenic AD mouse models. And that makes me wonder if beta amyloid might not be protective. And the reason you see it in plaques and tangles is that the AD kind of symptoms have now overwhelmed um, the protective mechanisms possibly created by beta amyloid and tau. So we published a couple of papers on that a few years ago, uh, starting to look at that. That was while I was still in Texas before I came to Caleb. Yes, so I, I think that would that would break the, um, the dogma. And um, uh, it's very intriguing and should inspire a lot of collaborations. With, with this, I would like to close our um, session. Thank you everyone for logging in. 
Um, I think this, this was um, a great, great opportunity to think about how uh, we approach aging. And thank you so much for both um, Bill and Rochelle for the very thoughtful presentations and for keeping the time. It was really fantastic. Thank you so much and have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.